Hey, I'm Scott Horton here, and I'm so excited about Commodity Discs from CommodityDiscs.com. They're one-ounce silver pieces with a QR code engraved on the back side. Scan the code with your phone and get the instant spot price. Commodity Discs are paving the way forward for the alternative currency community in America and around the world. The QR code Commodity Disc. Technology has now finally made a real free market silver currency viable. And anyone who donates $100 or more to The Scott Horton Show at scotthorton.org slash donate gets one free. That's CommodityDiscs.com. You gotta love the totalitarian states of America. The homeland that has consumed our country. Guy fires a warning shot, gets 20 years. You know, it's not like he was born with rights or anything. Not that any government employees are bound to respect anyway. All right, I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, Scott Horton Show. Oops. Better try that again. Thought I had it already. There he is. Hey! Scott, uh, is that you? Hey, look, everybody, I got Eric Margulies online. Welcome back to the show, Eric. Uh, hello, Scott. Uh, very happy to have you here. Uh, everybody, you know Eric, he wrote the books War at the Top of the World and American Raj, Liberation or Domination, and he writes at ericmargulies.com, spell it like Margolis, ericmargulies.com, and also you can find what he writes at unz.com, U-N-Z, unz.com, and at lewrockwell.com. Uh, very happy to have you back. And, uh, oh no, what I do with that article of yours from LRC about what is going on in Hong Kong. Uh, I meant to say this off the air, I forgot, so I'll tell you now. What I'd like to do is I'd like to talk with you about uh, uh, the DPRK in Hong Kong for the first segment and then uh, the Iraq-Syria war for the second, if that's possible. So, I guess, just real quick, can you just give us a nutshell uh, view of what's going on, uh, your view of what's going on in North Korea right now? Well, I don't know. Uh, It's very unclear. It it appears something is happening, but uh, we don't know what. Uh, The the beloved leader of of North Korea, uh, Kim Jong-un, baby Kim, as they call him, has been out of sight for a month. Uh, This is very unusual because he loves to showboat and grandstand and go around. Uh, so there are all kinds of rumors swirling when that there's been a coup, the military's unseated him, his sister's taken over, uh, we, uh, he's ill, we just don't know. Uh, and today there was an exchange of shots, uh, gunfire between uh, North and South Korean vessels, uh, no reports of high alert along the DMZ. Uh, that's it, we just don't know. All right, well, so... Uh... What could it possibly mean when you have a delegation go to meet with the South Koreans? Uh, they held very short talks, I guess, toward the having of talks. Within a month, they said, and not just some talks, but with the Reunification Council. What exactly is the Reunification Council? And interpret, please. It's an, it's an organization uh, in uh, South Korea, and I think there's a mirror version in North Korea, that's supposed to talk about reunification and then talk and talk and talk. It's a talking shop. N- never produces anything. Uh, I this the meeting that the, the North Korean delegation of high-ranking people I think was scheduled. You, know, you have to understand in Korean relations they blow hot and cold constantly. One day they're accusing each other of being baby-killing, warmongering fascists. And the next day, there are fraternal Korean brothers and glory to United Korea. So you, you just don't know at this point. But um, there's great personal animosity between the South Korean president and lady president, President Park, and between Kim Jong-un. They keep hurling insults, insults at each other. It's all great fun as long as it doesn't uh, erupt in a war. Right. Now... So here's the thing. I mean, I know people just sit around starving to death all the time up there in uh, communist uh, hell. Uh, but the regime always seems pretty stable uh, from the grandfather to the son and to the grandson. And um, I know there's a little bit of pull back and forth between the Communist Party and the military uh, and, and aunts and uncles and brothers and cousins in the ruling family. But it seems like the regime is typically pretty stable. But here we have a very strange situation, a, a very mysterious situation, where the dictator goes missing, his sister comes out. But then we have 
what I guess seemed, was it just overblown by TV because of coincidental timing that this meeting of the council uh, signified a major change? Like, like, not just power had been seized, but maybe power had been seized by someone so that they could do this seemed to be the implication, no? Well, I think my, I tend to think it was coincidental uh, rather than planned, but uh, but who knows? Uh, North Korea is always a mystery wrapped up in an enigma. And don't forget that a couple of months ago, the Kim Jong-un had his unbeloved uncle hauled out of a meeting on, t- on the TV cameras, taken out a shot. So uh, there are obviously strains within even the family ruling structure. But, you know, we have to be careful because almost all our news about North Korea comes from South Korea. And it's uh, South Korean intelligence uh, has a whole bureau uh, fabricating bad news about North Korea and sending out nasty things. And they put out all kinds of phony baloney reports. So great caution. Hmm. And now, so here's the thing, too, is uh, at least it was certain under the Bush years. I can't imagine this has really changed. American policy is to never allow reunification. So I guess two questions. Do you think that you know, without America involved, that there really could be any kind of real push toward reunification here? And then secondly, would America crush that if they even really tried it? Well, I I don't think there would be a real push because the the future of the Kim family, uh, a ruling Kim family in North Korea, would be diluted in any kind of reunification because there are a lot more Southerners, they've got all the money, uh, so obviously there would be a loss of uh, power. Better to, better to rule in hell than serve in heaven, as uh, the as the poem goes. But the uh, for the South Koreans, they would like reunification. But they, they, when I was in South Korea, the one thing I kept hearing all uh, they were scared of was not invasion from North Korea, but unexpected reunification, uh, which means that the North collapses. And uh, millions, 22, 25 million starving refugees come pouring south across the DMZ or take rafts and boats and head uh, on the prevailing current to Japan. Ooh, but all that cheap labor. And and in the south, I mean, it would seem like if they reunify, be the southern government is the one that survives, but they get the nukes. So that's pretty good. I mean, I know it would be hard economically for a little while to adjust, but it seems like the South would like to absorb the North if they could get away with it without a fight, no? Well, it's the cost of doing it. It would be titanic. By the way, the South can make their own nukes within three months if they want to. The U.S. under the, under the current President Park's father, uh, Park Jung-hee, uh, where the U.S. has caught the South Koreans starting to make nuclear weapons on the sly and stopped them. But uh, South Korea certainly has the capability. But the problem is that the South Koreans saw the cost of German reunification. The Germans are still paying for the absorption of East Germany, and uh, it was a good idea. But only the rich Germans in the Korean view could really afford it. The South Korea is 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 not a rich country, and it uh, would struggle forever to uh, rebuild North Korea. So their preference really is to maintain the status quo. Hmm. You think even if the communist government fell, they still might not necessarily want to reunify, just they maybe might be friends with the new regime? Yeah. They would just encourage another communist or non-communist government to uh, take over in the north. And what is also significant, Scott, is that uh, Japan does not want to see a, a unified Korea. So it would probably jump in and start financing whatever group came to power in North Korea because a united Korea would be a very important military and economic rival to Japan. And remember, the, the Koreans hate the Japanese and have vowed to get revenge on them for humiliating them in the in the last century. Oh, man. And uh, the Russians don't want to see a united Korea particularly, nor do the Chinese, because they're afraid that Korea would become a, an advanced American base pointing at the heart of Manchuria. Right. Yeah, and the Americans, too. They have right now, the North is basically nobody. I mean, they're sort of a nuisance, but not really any kind of threat. And the South is... 
stuck dependent on us as long as they have that enemy in the north. So it makes for a pretty good status quo all around, I guess, for the for the government's interests, not for the people. Necessarily. That's right. Everyone loves the status quo, except uh, for occasional outbursts from the North Korea who say we are going to. The, the North Koreans have always claimed that South Korea is an American colony and uh, that uh, they are the authentic Koreans and they are going to liberate South Korea from American domination. Well, and they kind of have a point, right, when America inherited the Japanese sock puppet regime and kept it after World War II. That's correct. But uh, I haven't met many South Koreans who want to be absorbed by North Korea. And particularly <laughs> yeah. because, That's a different question, right? Just the first part. <laughs> about 40% of Koreans are Christians of different varying types, evangelical, Catholics, etc. Uh, aside from after the Philippines, Korea, South Korea has Asia's largest Christian population, I think. And uh, they are violently anti-communist, and they have no desire to uh, become North Korean citizens. Yeah, no, nah, certainly not. All right, yeah, who wants to just starve to death? That sounds pretty miserable. Um, all right, now let me uh, ask you about what's going on in Hong Kong, and uh, especially because it's in here somewhere, and it's a, I know it's a big, complicated mess and a gigantic complicated Chinese empire, and Hong Kong is its own giant complicated city-state and all of these things. But somewhere buried in here is American intervention, too. So that's the most important part to me. But please, just make me smart about Hong Kong, Eric. Well, when Hong Kong uh, uh, was absorbed by China, reabsorbed, reunited with China in 1997, the agreement was that there would be two, uh, two systems and one state. Uh, and China would grant Hong Kong uh, almost complete business autonomy uh, and that uh, it would uh, share a role in the governing of uh, Hong Kong. Uh, the Hong Kongers were very happy with this uh, situation, but China still maintained a lot of influence. So we have to step back and remember that when Hong Kong was a, a British colony, it had no democracy. It was ruled by a British appointed governor. And uh, so really, the, Hong Kong had more democracy under China or has than it had under Britain. However, comma, uh, as uh, tightening efforts by the new Chinese leader, Xi Jinping, to tighten, you know, really get a tighter grasp on affairs in China, uh, Beijing has said that in uh, 2017 and the next elections in Hong Kong, that it will select the candidates and not Hong Kong. This has led to uh, major student revolts uh, that have really shaken the colony. They have not spread to the mainland further on, uh, but they offered the biggest challenge to the Chinese Communist Party leadership since the Tiananmen Square uprising. Mm. So the Communist Party is sort of like Goldman Sachs. They pick the candidates that we pick from kind of thing. Uh, that's right, but they have higher ethics than Goldman Sachs. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, all right. And now, so uh, what about all these uh, kids in the streets? Just, is this just another color-coded revolution? or I think it's a combination, Scott. I think it's a youthful exuberance. Uh, students are always up, right? Panty raids, rioting, this type of thing. <laughs> uh, you know, we have, we can't downplay that. Uh, but it's a new younger generation that is not yet imbued with business and making money, and it's still inspired by democracy. It's get, it, it, it hears what the West is saying. It has much more open communications, uh, better, freer newspapers, better uh, internet access. So, it, it it has it wants more freedom. They, like all young people, they're tired of being told what to do by their parents, whether at home or the Communist Party. Uh, so there's that's one element, and that is the primary element. Secondly, Hong Kong is a declining economic power in the Chinese context. It used to be the only gateway into China. All of China's export trade went out through Hong Kong. Anything would, would go in. So Hong Kong boomed. In fact, Hong Kong was built by refugees from Shanghai, the great trading center of China. 
Today, Shanghai is, is, is rapidly emerging as the premier uh, economic powerhouse in China. It is. Uh, and a lot of Chinese export business is going out through Shanghai. This means that uh, Hong Kong has less influence uh, and it has less future jobs. And the young people there, like in the States, are worried about their future. Yeah. And so what does the NED have to do with it then? Anything? Well, we don't know how far, but uh, the, the National Endowment for the Democracy and all these other American false flag, quote, democracy, unquote, organizations uh, are implanted in Hong Kong as they are in many countries around the world. They have become the leading edge of U.S. efforts to stir up opposition to local governments, uh, particularly through social media. It, it did it in Iran. It's done it in Georgia, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing it now going on in the Middle East. Uh, it, it's a very effective soft power technique. They are in Hong Kong. Uh, it's hard to say just how much they've played a role in stirring up uh, the anti-Beijing riots. According to the Chinese authorities in Beijing, they are primarily behind the unrest in China, in Hong Kong. Hmm. Well, yeah, see, I don't know about that. I'm with you on the primary cause is, uh, you know, why should anybody like the government of China, whether the Americans agree with them or not, you know? Um, and, well, from what I read, which wasn't much, but what I read about the NED in China was they'd given hundreds of thousands of dollars and maybe right where it really counted. But then again, that does sort of sound like a drop in the bucket when you're talking about a massive movement like this in a city like that, right? I think so, but uh, these U.S. undercover regime change operations have become very sophisticated, and we can't underestimate their effectiveness. Yeah. Well, and of course, just because the NED says we gave this many hundred thousand dollars doesn't mean they didn't give that many million, you know. Well, so, that's right. Because the CIA I don't mean not, to presume them innocent or anything, because I surely don't. That's right. And, and don't forget uh, uh, Freedom House. That's right. another yeah. operation. It's a major false flag. U.S. government. Uh, George Soros there, right. Regime change operation. Yeah. And dominated by the neocons, too. All right. Now, so. I want to talk with you about a little bit of the history of the recent war in Syria leading up to the gigantic declaration of the caliphate and the fall of Mosul and everything in June. And that is because, and I'm just going from memory here, I really should have done the work before the show, Eric, but I'm just going from memory, and it seems like there were just a few, but they were pretty important sources that came out in the summer and maybe the early autumn of 2011 saying that, uh, the Americans and the Western powers are working with the Saudis on a regime change plan for Syria. Uh, Act 2 of the war against Gaddafi, basically. And from very early on, maybe before the, uh, you know, veterans of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, you know, really even ran straight from Iraq to Syria to begin the creation of the Al-Nusra Front, Prince Bandar uh, according to The Guardian, was already organizing guys to go and fight there. Then you wrote an article, which I'm sorry I don't have it in front of me, but I know it ran at lourockwell.com because I can picture it. And what you said in there was that French special forces and intelligence guys are working on this project too. And then there's one more major one that I can't for the life of me remember. But then in December, Giraldi wrote at antiwar.com and in the American Conservative that Obama had signed a new finding ordering support for the rebellion. Now, the amount and degrees and all that, I'll let you elaborate on all that, too. I don't, know, I don't really know. But I was just wondering if you could remind us, of whatever you remember, about what you knew and when and, and to what extent America was working with, was even perhaps behind, organizing the effort for Saudi and Qatar and Turkey and Jordan to all work to support the rebellion in Syria, even though I guess I would concede the Americans are trying to support this FSA while the Saudis are supporting al-Sham and the Qataris are supporting al-Nusra and God knows, I don't know exactly what, but you were on to this from the very, very beginning. So tell me the truth of it, please. Well, Scott, the truth is that under the Bush administration, 
under pressure from the neocons in the, in the, in the administration, there was a plan developed with the Israelis to invade Syria and overthrow its government and also invade Lebanon and crush Hezbollah. Um, it, it didn't happen because a few wise voices, probably in the Pentagon, said, wait a minute, if you overthrow the government of Syria, who are you going to replace it by? The major organization is the Muslim Brotherhood underground, and they'll be a, a less uh, of a good uh, ally than uh, the Syrian government. What was crazy was Syria was a, a de facto American ally. It wasn't doing anything bad against, you know, or to hinder the United States' imperial policies in the Middle East. Uh, but the plan was still would dropped. It was then resuscitated four years ago, I think. Uh, I'm going by memory, too. Maybe three and a half years ago, when it was the U.S. that, uh, and probably in cahoots with the Israelis, uh, started the uprising in Syria along the, near the Lebanese and Jordanian borders. And they took uh, advantage of popular dis discontent with the Assad regime, but they actually sparked a rebellion there as they had done in Libya and armed it and then brought in advisors and French intelligence were, were agents were there. Uh, and that was the, the beginning of the open revolt against the Assad regime which now continues three, four years later. Uh, and we've been pouring arms and we've been pouring secret special forces into the area. Yes, our heroic and democratic Arab allies, such as Saudi Arabia and Qatar and places like that, have been helping their pet groups. It's a replay of the Lebanese civil war in the 1970s. Everybody's supporting a different group, and the result is chaos. Yeah. All right, now, so, I mean, I remember that Bush accidentally fought a war for the Ayatollahs, Khomeini, and Sistani, and then thought better of it too late, and so they did this redirection you're talking about. Well, let's reassign with Saudi policy. We'll back Fatah al-Islam in, uh, this was the Hirsch article in 2007, Fatah al-Islam in Lebanon, and the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria, and Jandala, although it turned out that was Mossad posing as CIA, recruiting Jandala in uh, Eastern Iran. Uh, but so, yeah, all of that. But now, so when it comes to 2011 and the start of the war here, I mean, it, it's obvious. They're like, oops, we, we, uh, gave all Southern Iraq to Iran. Well, the consolation prize is let's try to take Assad down a peg. But now, I was just talking with Mitchell Prothero from McClatchy Newspapers, who's been reporting from Syria and Iraq all this time. And he was saying to me that, yeah, you know, they may have been talking about supporting the rebels, but most of it was complaining that they're not supporting the rebels enough and, and you know, quote unquote enough anyway. But and for the good reason that the Americans got cold feet with this right away and that Obama has really not helped to arm all these groups. And the CIA has really not helped to coordinate Saudi and Jordan and Turkey. They actually don't give a damn what Obama wants. They do whatever they want. And Obama basically had decided as far back ago as, I don't know exactly when, more than a year ago, maybe more than two years ago, according to Mitchell Prothero, that no, in fact, he does not want to do this. Uh, but it's, he'll be damned if he could get the Saudis and the Qataris, et cetera, to stop. What do you think of that? Well, I think the U.S. government is having less and less influence over its Arab vassal states. Yes, they do conduct their own policy on the ground regionally. But they keep an eye on Washington, and they wouldn't do anything violently opposing uh, U.S. Uh, demands. But the uh, the important thing is the U.S. has been pouring arms and money here, is fueling the civil war in Syria. We've created three million refugees. We're the biggest refugee creator on earth. Add add five million Palestinians, and uh, it's it's a disaster. We have been tearing up Syria. Uh, as the Saudis and the other Arabs have been waging their own little petty rivalries in Syria, trying to one-up each other. But overall, the, the, the major problem the U.S. has run into is that these, these bogus political organizations it's been trying to create to, to, to front for this so-called revolution, like the Free Syrian Army, uh, have been useless. They all they do is bicker and argue with each other. A bunch of little Napoleons sitting in Istanbul have no influence whatsoever in Syria. 
they and the Americans keep getting scared because they think that uh, that even more radical groups are going to emerge. It's happened with uh, uh, ISIS, and uh, the Israelis are stirring the part pot from behind the scenes. They're delighted to see Syria being destroyed because they know that one day they are going to uh, be the beneficiaries of this war. Yeah, well, maybe in some ways, I guess. I don't know. It seems uh, seems like it's all very dangerous. But now, so you think they were underestimating, like they're claiming ignorance now, that, uh, you know, they're saying, well, geez, we just underestimated the Iraqi army's will to fight, this kind of thing. Because I've got articles and interviews with Patrick Coburn, for one, I'm sure you and I talked about this at the time, a year and a half ago now, spring 2013, Iraqi soldiers abandoning their posts up in Sunnistan and heading back towards Shiistan because they've got no backup. They're miles from home. It's not really their territory. It's a foreign country now that they're attempting to occupy, and they're failing at it, and they're giving up. And that's not, and that's, you know, uh, even still, that's nine months before Fallujah hoisted the black flag, uh, which was still six months before the fall of Mosul. But Patrick Coburn was writing about, hey, looks like the rise of the caliphate to me. And hell, from the moment that they renamed it, well, there was a faction fight there. It was complicated. But the first step was that Baghdadi renamed al-Nusra, the Islamic, because it was one organization, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. So what does that mean right there? If you already know that the Iraqi army doesn't really have control of Sunnistan in western and northwestern Iraq, um, and you already know that eastern Syria is in the hands of Nusra and or uh, ISIS, this group, and they're calling, calling themselves a state, at least, you know, it's not that they really were a state yet at that point, but it was clear that there was no one there to oppose them from creating a state. And I wrote in the Future Freedom Foundation thing in April of 2013 that, look, it's the rise of that ridiculous Islamo-fascist caliphate of bin Laden and George Bush's fantasies is actually coming to life in real life. And that was a more than a year before the fall of Mosul. And yet Obama and Clapper and all these guys go on TV and say, yeah, man, this whole thing really took us by surprise. Well, they're idiots. And uh, they should all be fired. Uh, they uh, don't deserve to work in a McDonald's, not to mention Washington. I'm horrified by the ineptitude of government and the uh, intelligence agencies, uh, the, the, it's, it is really shameful for even our president to say that, uh, they were, they were surprised. Clapper, the man who lied to Congress about the National Security Agency is now guiding our Mideast policy. It's, it's very scary. And the problem is that nobody in Washington is really in charge of this Mideast policy. There are many cooks, uh, with spoons in this, in this uh, broth. Uh, you know, there's the Pentagon, there's the oil industry, there are the idiots in Congress, there are, there's the Israel lobby, uh, there are the Saudis buying whoever they want. So, uh, it's a big mess and uh, it's going to continue being a big mess because look, people in Washington just don't understand what's going on there. I remember, uh, before the 2003 invasion when I was talking to some very senior administration people, and they said, well, Eric, what do you think is going to happen in Iraq? I said, well, have you considered about the Shiites? Have you considered about the uh, Zaidis or the Yazidis? <laughs> I mean, what about the Kurds? Like, and they, I remember one of these guys said to me, one of the very senior national security thing, he said, don't, don't confuse us with all these details. Just give us the bottom line. I said, the bottom line is don't invade Iraq. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, they don't understand. So really... I mean, I guess just to ask the question is to answer it. The National Security Council, they don't read Coburn. I mean, you would think that even if they don't like him, that they would read him because he's Patrick Coburn. He knows what he's talking about. Sit down and read. If you want to know what the hell's going on around here, you can't not read Patrick Coburn. What are we doing here? Our government is run by people who don't read Patrick Coburn? Jesus. God help us. Or listen to Scott Horton. Uh, we don't. Uh, people want just to read what confirms their views. Like if you want, you, if you want the completely mistaken view about the Middle East, you read the Wall Street Journal and watch Fox News, and you'll get that in spades. Right, right, yeah, exactly. Don't, but, don't, 
don't disturb my prejudices. It's taken me a long time to develop them. That's the prevailing attitude. And uh, don't, don't confuse me with all these uh, questions. All right. Well, I'll let you go. I've already kept you over. But thanks very much, Eric. Good to talk to you again. Always a pleasure, Scott. That's the great Eric Margulies, everybody. He is at ericmargulies.com, at lourockwell.com, and uns.com. The books are American Raj, A Liberation or Domination, and uh, also uh, War at the Top of the World. And we'll be right back. Hey, Al Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. This nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone. We are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org or thewarstate.com. Hey, Al Scott Horton here. It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. And if this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Robertson Roberts Brokerage, Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. And they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Robertson Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co. Hey, all Scott here. If you like me, you need coffee. Lots of it. And you probably prefer it tastes good, too. Well, let me tell you about Darren's Coffee Company at DarrensCoffee.com. Darren Marion is a natural entrepreneur who decided to leave his corporate job and strike out on his own, making great coffee. And Darren's Coffee is now delivering right to your door. Darren gets his beans direct from farmers around the world, all specialty, premium grade, with no filler. Hey, the man just wants everyone to have a chance to taste this great coffee. Darren's Coffee. Order now at darrenscoffee.com. Use promo code SCOTT and save $2. darrenscoffee.com. 